if you are a fan of the fiddle, and not the little violins I'm talking about, but the orchid fiddle, you've come to the right place. Oh boy. Chop and Prop is going to come as a second part of this video. First of all, I would like to get the Maxillaria tenuifolia that I got from Mince Orchids and ADD back in 2022 into a pot. I've had plenty of time to think about this, how I'm going to go about it, what is the best course of action, which is everything that I'm going to cover. And I will be discussing my decision making process when we get into this orchid. So like I said, if you're a fan of the fiddle, stick around. This is going to be a little bit tedious seeing as I've never done it before. <laughs> Unchartered territory. Not that I've not grown a tenofolia before, but this is a cutting and you can very, very clearly see, at least I hope you can, that this is a climber. <laughs> And I need to accommodate that, but my climate isn't humid enough for me to be able to mount it. It's going to take a lot of misting and I don't want to be losing any of the new growths by misting so much, which is absolutely necessary for a very, very water loving orchid. So, huh. since July, I believe I have this orchid in my fancy schmancy Greek yogurt cup because I wanted to see how long it was going to take until I saw white roots coming out at the base. See, that's what I've got to work with. Yes, there is roots all along these little sheaths here. But again, if I had potted this orchid up sooner, I would have been in trouble during the winter because misting, cold temperatures, whoops, serious issues can arise. Now that we are in spring though, I'm going to attack this orchid, put her in a pot because this time of year I can be aggressive with the misting. You can see it's quite a breezy day already. And then the orchid will at least dry out and I don't have to worry about rot. The question of course was how am I going to get this orchid into a pot with a little stump like that? So um, yeah, I've been thinking a lot, of course. I've seen this orchid for a long time in the state that it is in and I've come to the conclusion like I said fiddle fans that I'm going to strap this orchid to a stake just a normal old phalaenopsis spike stake and then with the stake as my support instead of growing the orchid this way even though the foliage is going up and down I'm going to be laying it down for the foreseeable future and the orchid will then correct itself with regards to light and orientation and all that. It's going to take a couple of years, but still, this way, I believe that I'm going to be able to at least get roots into the media, get some of the moisture that they desperately need, seeing as now they've been accustomed to that much moisture, while also still holding the orchid in place. I know. Like I said, uncharted territories, it's going to be a fiddle and I hope you're up for it. And then afterwards, I'm just going to quickly do a little grooming, a little chopping and propagating cousin it. And we'll be potting those cuttings up as well. That shouldn't take that much time, but I do want to show you at this stage, because with cousin it, we're not going to see it as good as we can see here, how the roots are coming down and out. And seeing as it's now the growing season, we need to take advantage of that because Cousin It is looking a little bit unruly and a little bit of maintenance is not going to hurt him one iota. You can see that I've got a few little new growths that have come since the orchid has been with me. They're not here nor there, but they are important because of the new roots that are coming from it. So let's see, this is gonna test <laughs> innovation on a whole different level. I'm already going to crock my pot with my chipped and broken lecker because I'm going to be filling up with ceramis and I don't want to waste the ceramis. So we'll take that, make sure we don't get it blown around the patio. There we go. Now, the idea being is to find the point of where I'm going to be pinning the orchid to the stake and also keeping in mind the height of the orchid in the pot <laughs> to the surface of the media, while the stake also serves 
as an anchor point. On top of that, I have some wire because I don't want the rolling. With the wind, the breeze, this orchid now needs to stay nice and stable in the pot as the roots grow into the media. So I need to avoid any rolling. So I have some wire, which I will then also fandangle in and through the ceramics. Now that is the plan. So if you're into engineering, you're into orchid growing, <laughs> welcome to the patio. It's good to have you here. Thank you so much. So my point of reference is right here. And I'm going to take one of my very thin, I just lost my steak, as in not the meat. <laughs> okay, you can tell I haven't had lunch yet. Anyway, this wire is not sturdy at all, but it is nicely coated in plastic. It's going to serve me well to wrap the orchid onto the steak. And then let me get rid of the excess of the steak at the end here because otherwise we're going to have that tipping problem all the time. But I'm just going to leave myself a little bit at the end, just as a visual reminder that it's there, because if all this goes according to plan, well, <laughs> I need to remember it's there until such a time when it comes to repotting and I'm not met with, what did I do? What was I thinking back in the day? <laughs> you can see that the pseudobulbs are nicely plump now. There was a time when they were extremely shriveled. The older ones still have a little bit of sign of stress. But basically, they are nice and plump at this point. And I can go a little bit lower. I don't have to fill everything up with ceramics. The orchid can be nicely placed a little bit lower in the pot. And I've got my point of reference right here. So this is where we're going to start whoop, wrapping and slowing down. I'm too fast at the moment in my head because I do want to keep my train of thought <laughs> and not lose the plan here, you know what I mean? Right, I'm just going to sit down for a bit because this may be a little bit cumbersome. But that is the way with maxillarias when we can't mount them and still want the roots in the pot. Make sure I'm going to take the bulbs with me as opposed to splitting them off. Because if this is a brittle orchid, I don't know if she is or not, but the structures are so small, I don't want to pop the pseudobulbs off that are existing at the moment. So I'm just going to wrap this around once and then again just to secure her. Comme ça. Being mindful of the roots as well, like that. And then we'll see where we can go up a little bit further, maybe. Unless we're pushing our luck. If I lose the newest pseudobulbs, just because they're a little bit too low in the pot, at least it won't affect the rest of the orchid. She will still grow more new growths. I am gambling with the vigor of Maxillaria tenuifolias. So I have an older pseudobulb here that I'm taking advantage of, using the sheath to protect the roots inside with the wire. And then we'll just take this structure, go underneath the leaf, comme ça, and go up to the end of the stake. And by that time, my orchid is secure. <laughs> That's the way, uh -huh, uh -huh, I like it. But I do have to make a kind of a knot with this wire because it's that easy to unravel. So once we've gotten to this stage, let's just make sure that the work that we've done, the trouble we've gone into, it stays the way it's supposed to. And a loop is only useful if you thread <laughs> the wire through one of the points. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not going to be a loop and there's nothing to tie it against. <laughs> okay. But you see, with all that fiddle and all that jiggling that I've just done, whew, this orchid is secure. She's not going anywhere. Ta-da! <laughs> 
Ah, uh, it would be lovely to be able to mount this orchid. Now, I've got my holes back there. That's always a reminder for me to make sure that I know where they are if I'm carrying the pot around. You see this rocking motion? Yeah, I don't want that. So we're going to make another wire little contraption and we can do that further up. Seeing as in future, the weight of the orchid will be higher. So I wanna make sure that I use that as a counterbalance by putting a support into the media at the highest point of the orchid. Once she's rooted in, all of this is gonna be absolutely null, void, and obsolete. This is all temporary until she settles in. I like it a lot. So far, so good. Your opinions, your concerns, <laughs> your observations. Will this work or won't it? Please let me know your thoughts in the comments. Because now we're just going to fill up with ceramics. My focus is to get this section right here where the roots are into the media. Now normally when I pot up, I like to fill water into the pot so that the media easily settles in and around the roots. Not necessary in this case because A, there are no roots that are necessary to be protected. And secondly, ceramis is such a nightmare to work with while wet. It sticks to your hands, it doesn't settle nicely, it, it's just a nightmare unless you have it in a bowl and then you can pour it in. But I find that working with dry ceramics is so, so much easier. Now I'm going to go really up against the base, right by the stake, because if the new growths were to come at that end, the roots would hit the media much, much sooner as well. But I do want ceramics out of the crevices because ceramics once wet stays wet for a long time. That's the whole point of this exercise, but it could also induce rot when the temperatures aren't as nice. So trying to plan ahead a little bit. Can't tell you how excited I am to get this orchid into a pot. Finally, not only has she been in this <laughs> Greek yogurt thing for all this time, but the Greek yogurt thing was in this pot because I knew I wanted to use one of these for her. So it's time and I'm so happy. It's working, you guys. Look at how stable the orchid is. Woohoo! I knew that my architecture studies would come in handy one day. <laughs> let me just get rid of this. Oh, let me just put these little ceramist bits here into the Tupperware. I don't waste anything. Try not to take the debris along with you. There we go. All right. And we are now going to fill the reservoir with calcium magnesium at 100 parts per million. That's the mix not with Epsom salts and calcium nitrate. It's the pre-made mix, calcium of magnesium, 100 parts per million, and seaweed, which I've added 50 parts per million for this flush, just to encourage the roots to go where we want them to go. As in, hello, Maxillaria tenifolia, you get to settle in now. That is the plan. This makes me happy. You ready for Cousin It? I am. I don't think Cousin It is ready, but needs must. Just delaying the inevitable just a little bit more, I wanted to show you where my Maxillaria tenifolia will be living. The light source is coming from the left here, that is south, and the west right there. As well as in the morning, the sun will hit this orchid from the east, which is actually us right here. But you see, I want her now to grow up either that way, that way, or that way. The balance, try to create a balance and see what happens. 
that is the point of the exercise. <laughs> I think she looks really nice there. I already told you that I'm so glad to get rid of this Tupperware thing. It's been far too long. Anyway, now let's go and get Mr. Grumpy. Actually, he'll be happy until he sees what we're about to do with him. <laughs> there he is. I don't know if you saw the live stream where I cleared out all the maiden hair fern. After that stream ended, I went a little bit more to town around the dish. I can actually see water levels now. <laughs> don't have to pour until overflowing to know that that dish is full. But you see all the stragglers down here? These? Why not give him a little bit of a facelift, foliage lift, canopy lift? Why not? use those stragglers, propagate them, and then give parts of Cousin It and make mini Cousin It's, give them away. Something like that. And that is why I showed you the root system, how I waited for the roots to actually grow down so I could see before the tenuifolia was going to be potted up. Because here, we don't have that luxury. We're just gonna be taking off the ends right up to the base of the orchid and then we were going to be potting them up and then hopefully during the growing season because the orchid is in active growth which is something super important during the growing season the roots will grow into the seedling cups so let me get you in a little bit closer that would mean the other side and i'm going to be <laughs> twisting and turning as best as possible he is a bit of a colossus at the moment now, maxillarias are vigorous, they are robust, they can take a beating, etc. However, you don't want to push it when it comes to cuttings and propagating them. You want to make sure you have plenty of bulbs in reserve. With every other orchid, we talk about a minimum of three bulbs in order to make sure that the propagation, the division is going to be able to have enough energy reserves in order for it to grow on. Same with a maxillaria. A couple of months ago, I tried a two bulb division. That didn't work out. And that is why I'm telling you, if you're going to do this, two things, make sure you have enough structures on any kind of the branching growths that you're gonna cut out. And secondly, make sure that the orchid is in active growth. Doesn't mean that where you're gonna cut from is in active growth. Maxillaria will respond regardless. Any of the new nodes will activate as well. So let me get in there and take one of the longest ones out as far in as possible. So we have four bulbs here, even though the top one is leafless, it doesn't matter. I'm anticipating new growths out of the one up here. But when it comes to a division like this, they can come out of anywhere. Now, this is all dry and nasty. So each time I make a cut and I have a piece like this, it's going into a bucket with calcium and magnesium to soften the sheaths because when we pot them up, I want them nice and damp, at least to provide some sustenance around the roots that are existing in those sheaths. Here we have another long one. Four bulbs into the bucket. And we're gonna do this all around the orchid. I said, facelift. <laughs> with the exception of the small ones. If there's bulbs that are as tiny as this, I'm not gonna attack them. We're gonna go with what we can get out that is super strong. Even if they're in bloom, Hakuna Matata, active growth. Woohoo! I feel a bit rude looking under his skirt. <laughs> yes, today he's a Scotsman. He's wearing a kilt today. <laughs> doesn't matter if we lose a suitable we still have plenty 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 on this piece but if we want to get in and we want to leave a stem sometimes we forfeit a suitable where you can take the sheath off this will also encourage the roots to get into media and they don't have to fight any dryness this back end is more vigorous because it's more protected during the summer months. So it grew in a very shady, very humid environment up against the hedge. That's why we have a lot longer strands here. Some are even branching. 
but I may need to forfeit the branching to get at the base. So let's start with this one that we can see. At least I hope you can see. I know it, it's a bit difficult. Bear with me. I'm trying to document as much of the process as I can as a super loud scooter goes by. So there we go. Get some sheaths off. And I am not treating any of the cuts with cinnamon. I don't want to affect the roots, okay? Difference if we were making a division with another orchid through a rhizome that doesn't have roots. In this case, mm -mm, no cinnamon. I have never had rot issues when it came to cuttings of maxillarias. I may jinx myself having just said that, but still. Here we have a piece that has branched. Now, in order for this piece to actually make it, there's too much going on, we will have to separate it. That's the benefit of being able to make sure that both have a chance. It's a shame you would like to have a big piece like this. It's not gonna benefit the orchid though. Meanwhile, I don't feel I'm invading his privacy too much. I'm not seeing anything that I haven't seen before in my life. <laughs> okay, situation here. If I separate these pieces, I only have a two bulb division. So this is gonna stay intact. We're gonna keep this as one, just to make sure they stand a chance. got some roots and I pulled from the pot that's awesome if I didn't cut them off through and through either way we've got roots all the way up here it's fantastic this is so much fun just don't want to get carried away I have made accommodations for 12 cuttings and I want to leave some in case some don't take so that I can still do it again and not take away from him too much leaving me back up on the plant por si acaso you know Always try and have a plan B in place. There we go, we've lifted his canopy a little bit. I could take one from here, but I'm just gonna leave myself some reserves, just in case. Okie dokie, he's gonna have to come down from that little pedestal. It is very windy and I don't need him to fall. Let's go make ourselves a little bunch of maxillaria cuttings and get them potted up. Woohoo! Our spoils, our spoils. I need to make sure that they are all touching water. All of them. We'll be taking the blooms off so that we minimize the stress. So they so can focus their energy on what they need to be doing next. This orchid has been in bloom since the beginning, no, since mid-November of 2022. Astounding, absolutely astounding. Love this orchid. So we've got one, two, 12. All right, let's make our little bunches in, in advance. I'm thinking three bundles in four seedling cups. Let's see that we somewhat get equal bases and remove some of the sheaths now that they're nice and wet. Not too much, still need to protect those roots, especially if you're in a climate that is not as humid. If you're in a very humid climate, you can be a little bit more aggressive with removing sheaths, seeing as the humidity in your environment will take care of a lot of it. That is not the case in my climate, so my sheaths here will serve as a humidity protection when I mist their dampness will provide the humidity that my ambient air cannot. Okay, large, medium, small-ish, kind of like. Got the wire gauge, prepared my seedling cups here, filled the reservoir up to the holes, 
just to make sure that we've got something going on at the base and save on resources. And then I was just going to put out a little inspiration in case, in case you want to grow Maxillaria variabilis in a very humid climate. You can grow it as a wreath. If I were in a very humid climate, let me tell you what I would do with a Maxillaria variabilis. And maybe if you find yourself in a humid climate and are inspired, then you've got to let me know in the comments, if you're gonna do this, I want to be updated. I want to see how you're doing it, how your maxillaria is growing and how beautiful it's going to be. So let me tell you how I would grow maxillaria variabilis in a humid environment. I would go to Joanne's, Marshall's, Hobby Lobby, any of those craft stores, get myself a wreath, a twig wreath. It can be real, it can be full. I would stuff the wreath with sphagnum moss and then I would take my cuttings and pin them all along the wreath. And then I would hang that wreath on a wall or even have it suspended as a pendulum, upside down, whatever, wherever you're growing. And my maxillaria would then populate that wreath and just look amazing. Can you imagine a wall mount of a Maxillaria variabilis that then just goes into a specimen and looks like a big ball of goodness? Yeah. So if you feel inspired by that setup and you are going to do that, please let me know in the comments because oh my goodness, I'm jelly. But those are the visions I have about how to beautifully present a Maxillaria variabilis. Gotta have a humid climate though. Can't do it without humidity. So I'm just making little bundles and I'm wiring the bundles together and leaving a little bit of a length of the wire at the end to be my stake. I'm focusing my bundles in such a way that I get the rhizome pretty much level at the base, but I find a place where I can attach them and put them together. That is then where I'm going to pinch them, get my wire and do a curly whirly. And if they're stubborn at the base, one little turn. <laughs> just to convince them that I know what I'm doing. I miscalculated. We'll see where that one will go. And now it's going to get super interesting because we're going to be wetting some sphagnum moss. You're probably going, whoa, 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 wait, wait. We just did maxillaria tenuefolia in ceramis. What are you doing? What's, 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 what's this about? Well, if I were keeping these little cuttings, then <laughs> I would be putting them in ceramis, but seeing as I would like to know if anybody wants them in the future, not everybody grows inorganic. So my plan being, of course, if somebody wants them, I would like them to be ready and prepared to grow well in organic media. Transitioning to inorganic media is pretty easy after that. So let's get that moss in there. And get our bundle also in there with the steak and all, and then fill around with moss. The moss obviously also now soaking in calcium, magnesium, and seaweed. Perfect, I say perfect. There he is, Big Daddy and his bibbies. And yes, 
this is going to be part of my misting regime every day as well now. This is the process of propagating maxillaria variabilis, knowing that you're going to have results without stinging on how many pseudobulbs you cut off. So, there is one thing I need to say about this, that anybody who wants a piece of Cousin It, I'm sorry to limit that to the European Union only, and secondly, I cannot afford the shipping. So yes, while I'm giving the pieces away, if you want them, I'm going to have to charge you for the shipping. I'm in no position to be able to do that, which is awkward. I'm sorry. And of course, first come, first served in my email, okay? Not in the comments because who knows, in six months, somebody is going to see this video. It has to be in my email to which you will get a reply. And then I'll put your name on the tag of each bundle. So I've got four bundles. Please understand I can't afford shipping and I'm sorry it's limited to the EU. Send me an email. Dems are the conditions. But meanwhile, let me just say if you've made it to this point, thank you so much for watching. I would appreciate it if you gave this video a like. If you haven't subscribed, please go ahead and do that in the meantime. It helps out tremendously. Thank you so, so much for watching. Have yourself a fabulous day. On that one condition though, please, that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.